So today we're going to talk a bit about atoms and elements. This is kind of a fundamental thing in all of chemistry. When we think of chemistry, we think of elements, right, in the periodic table. So this is when it all starts to come together. So first off, what are atoms? Well, atoms are tiny, extremely tiny, right? In fact, there are more atoms in your eyeball than there are stars in the known universe, right? So these things are you know, everywhere, and they're extremely small. Now, atoms are the fundamental building blocks of all elements, and it turns out that we study atoms because the property of the atoms actually determines the properties of the elements themselves. So let's go ahead and back way up to when I was a kid in ancient Greece. We're going to talk a little bit about a celebrity grudge match. Okay, first off, our first contestant would be a guy by the name of Democritus. Okay, so Democritus, good looking guy, right? So he actually believed that matter was composed of atoms, right? Atom comes from the Greek for indivisible. So he believed that if you took like a block of gold, let's say, and you chopped that gold in half, and then you chopped it in half again, and then you chopped it in half again, and again, and again, at some point you'd actually reach a fundamental block that you could no longer, uh, you know, subdivide. And that he called the atom. He also believed that these atoms varied in their sizes and shapes, uh, you know, depending on whether it was gold or oxygen or, you know, whatever, although they didn't know all the elements back then, obviously, but he believed that the different substances around us were composed of different atoms. This makes sense. The problem was, another guy comes along, okay, you might have heard of him, Aristotle. He's a punk. <laughs> so it turns out that Aristotle actually believed that matter was infinitely divisible, that you could uh, continue to divide that block of gold over and over and over again, and you would never actually reach the end. It would just be smaller and smaller particles of gold. He also believed that there weren't all of these various uh, atoms, you know, that, that made everything up. Instead, he believed that matter was composed of just four elements, earth, water, fire, and air. Now, unfortunately, there was no way to um, actually, you know, uh, settle this, this grudge match here. They would just debate it, right? And so it turns out that whoever was better at debating wins, which happened to be Aristotle. And so for, you know, literally like, uh, you know, 2,000 years, we have this idea, this Aristotle this idea of matter being infinitely divisible. And it wasn't until a little later on, uh, in the 1800s actually, the guy, that a guy by the name of John Dalton came along and kind of shook everything up. And what he did is he actually went way back to this idea of Democritus that all elements are made of atoms. In fact, he even used or stole the word atoms from Democritus. Now, Dalton also said that all atoms of a given element are identical, right? Which means that if you have an oxygen atom, uh, you know, from New Hampshire, then it will be the exact same as an oxygen atom from Scandinavia or from the bottom of the ocean. The oxygen is oxygen is oxygen, and gold is gold is gold, right? He also believed that uh, because there are different atoms that make up gold versus sulfur, that those atoms of different elements have different properties, and this makes a lot of sense. It seems like common sense. Now, he also went back to this idea of Democritus, that these atoms are indivisible, right? That you cannot subdivide them, you cannot create them, you cannot destroy them. He also took this a step further, and he said that these atoms actually combine in different ratios, different uh, but simple whole number ratios, to form compounds. So, for instance, water is H2O, two parts hydrogen to one part oxygen, or two atoms of hydrogen to one atom of oxygen. Now, this kind of just comes from his idea that uh, if an atom is indivisible, you can't have two-thirds of a, a lithium atom combined with, you know, four-fifths of a nitrogen atom. It wouldn't make sense, right? You'd have to have something like three lithium, one nitrogen, these simple whole number ratios. And then Dalton also said, and these are the postulates of his atomic theory, he said that atoms can be combined, they can be separated, they can be rearranged uh, during chemical reactions, but again, you cannot create or destroy these in any way. Now, before we go any further, we need to understand a little bit about uh, charges, right? And this kind of goes back to kindergarten playing with magnets and north and south poles and so forth. But just to remind you that obviously there are positive and there are negative charges. Okay, we can call these, you know, plus and minus. These opposite charges attract each other. So a positive attracts a negative, 
and like charges repel. So you try to bring two positives close together, they repel. Two negatives close together, they repel. You try to bring a positive and a negative close together, and they attract each other. We're also going to say that if you have a positive one charge and a negative one charge, when you bring those together overall, the resulting you know, substance would have a neutral charge or zero charge. Now, John Dalton is considered one of the fathers of modern chemistry, right? He's a pretty big deal in chemistry, and we still use his atomic theory today. Unfortunately, though, he wasn't quite correct in some of his postulates. One of those is he said that atoms were indivisible, right? That you cannot subdivide them further. And it's true that if you, you know, you can't subdivide a gold atom and still have gold at the end of the day. However, there are things within the actual atom itself. So you can break apart an atom, and it's no longer an atom, but instead it's going to be composed of what we call subatomic particles. Now, the first of these subatomic particles that was discovered was the electron, right? So J.J. Uh, Thompson actually helped discover this, and there are some important things that we need to remember about electrons. The first is that electrons have a uh, negative charge. You do not need to memorize you know, the exact uh, charge in coulombs, but what I do want you to remember is that they have a negative one charge. That's going to be important because we'll talk about some other subatomic particles in a little bit. And we're going to always refer to like a plus one or a minus one charge. Also, you need to remember that electrons are tiny. Okay, you, you'll notice this number here that an electron has one one hundred or one thousand eight hundred thirty six the mass of a hydrogen atom. You don't need to know that number, but what I want you to remember is that they are small, incredibly tiny. In fact, in most cases we can actually ignore their mass because it's so negligible. Now the next idea that we have here, oh, back up a sec is we have this uh, idea of the plum pudding model. So this is developed, um, and this is kind of an interesting thing. I don't know if you've ever had uh, plum pudding, but the idea behind plum pudding is that you have, you know, kind of this bready, doughy thing, right? And then within that, you put in things, you know, like uh, maybe some raisins or something, uh, maybe some... I don't know, some dates or uh, um, cranberries or um, dead mice or I don't know, whatever you put in here, okay? And so this idea of the plum pudding model is pretty simple. What it says is that if you have, um, you know, this, this atom, okay, that within the atom itself, you're going to have, you know, this, um, you know, doughy, gooey mix of positive charge, okay? So all around here would be our positive charge. Now why would you need this, you know, weird, doughy, positively charged sphere? Well, it's important to remember that they knew about electrons, and electrons have a negative charge, right? So each of these electrons here, the little, you know, bits of fruity goodness in the middle here, all have negative charges. And if we didn't have some positive charges to cancel that out, then all of you know the universe would be negatively charged, everything would repel, and the whole thing would blast apart, and it wouldn't work, right? So here's the plum pudding model, right? That we have these big gooey positive sphere with a bunch of negative electrons kind of jabbed in there willy-nilly. Okay, and it's interesting. So a scientist by the name of Ernest Rutherford comes along, and he decides, you know what, if I'm going to test this plum pudding model, this idea that an atom is mostly just nebulous positive charge with a few little negative electrons thrown in there with negligible mass. Um, what, what, I, what can I do to actually test this? So like most guys, he thought, I'm going to shoot stuff at it, right? So what he did is he actually took some gold foil. He pounded it incredibly thin, and then he actually set up uh, kind of an interesting idea. He set up this uh, kind of semicircle of uh, like a little screen that would actually detect whenever um, kind of a bullet basically would would uh, you know hit this thing and what kind of bullet did he use well he used something called alpha particles it's not really important right now but what you should remember is that these alpha particles happen to have a positive charge okay 
So these things are positively charged, and they're relatively big, right? So compared to like a, a, an electron or something, these things are massive. And so what he did is he actually started to shoot these alpha particles at the gold. And um, because these gold atoms are supposedly just uh, mostly just empty, gooey, positive, you know, sphere, um, he expected that they would just go right through and that he would, you know, get this little ding right here on his screen showing that, sure enough, the alpha particle hit the screen. And in fact, that's what happened in almost every case, but not in every case. In fact, some of those alpha particles, as they're traveling along, would actually deflect and they would hit somewhere else. And then even more surprising, every now and then, when he would shoot alpha particles, they would actually ricochet back, and they would bounce back at him. And this idea is crazy, right? In fact, he, he said that it was as surprising as if you had uh, shot a 15-inch cannon shell at a piece of tissue paper and had it bounce back at you. That's how surprised he was by this finding. And so... What did he do? Well, he actually came up with a couple of, of um, you know, postulates or ideas about what's going on inside of this, uh, inside of these atoms. So, what did Rutherford conclude? Well, he said the atoms are mostly empty space. Okay, and this is very true. Um, the reason for this is that remember that the vast majority of the alpha particles, these little uh, bullets that he shot at the gold foil, went straight through. And so it turns out that the atom is mostly empty space, all right? And yet some of those were actually, some of those bullets were actually deflected by something small but incredibly massive within the gold atoms, okay? So this tiny dense particle, we're actually going to call this the nucleus, okay, that exists in the center of each atom, extremely tiny volume, but very, very, very large in mass, okay? In fact, um, you can imagine... Like, let's say that you went to, um, you know, a Red Sox game. All right, and at Fenway Park, let's say that Fenway Park is the size of um, an atom. Okay, or an atom is the size of Fenway Park. It turns out that a, um, the nucleus would actually be a P on the pitcher's mound. And that's incredibly tiny, right? One-tenth of a trillionth of all the volume of the entire atom. And yet... Um, that's where almost all the mass, besides the negligible amount of mass of the electrons, is all gathered right there in the nucleus, which is crazy, right? Um, so next time you have an argument with your significant other, uh, you can you know, just say, well, your head is just 99.99999% empty space, and they can't get mad at you because you're right. Except then they'll just say, well, so is yours, and you're like, dang it. All right. But um, So this explains why some of those... Uh, radioactive bullets were actually kind of, uh, you know, deflected. But remember that some of those bullets were actually bounced straight back at him, which means that that tiny little nucleus has to have a positive charge. So why a positive charge? Well, it turns out that, remember we said that opposites attract and like charges repel, right? So if the these um, bullets, these alpha particles that he's shooting at the at these atoms, those had a positive charge, remember? And so when they get too near to this positively charged nucleus, then they end up, uh, you know, repelling each other, and these things bounced back at them. So this explains why um, there's a, a positive charge in the nucleus. So again, remember that in, instead of having a plum pudding model, we now have the nuclear model, and the center of this is the nucleus, right? Has virtually all the mass, has a positive charge, and the electrons would then be dispersed around uh, this nucleus. Okay, so to, you know if you kind of want to to visualize this, you can think of you can think of an atom as having a nucleus, right, with these tiny little a tiny little nucleus in the center. Actually, let's back that up real quick for some reason. Let's try this again. Okay. So you have this tiny little nucleus in the middle, and then the electrons would be dispersed in this, what we call an electron cloud, kind of just out here, kind of this nebulous thing. So 
virtually all the mass would be there in the center, and then these electrons would just be these tiny little guys kind of floating around out in space. Now, that's not a perfect model of this, but you get the idea. Now, what do we actually have inside the nucleus? Well, Rutherford came up with this idea of protons. Okay, I always think of P for proton, P for positive, because protons are going to have an equal but opposite charge as an electron. So again, you don't need to know the exact you know, charge in coulombs or anything, but remember that electrons have a minus one charge. Protons, we're going to say, have a plus one charge, equal but opposite. Now, um, protons are much, much, much larger than um, electrons. Remember that electrons have a negligible mass. Protons actually have a mass of approximately one AMU, one atomic mass unit. Okay. Now, a very important thing for us to remember is that if we want a neutral atom, okay, an atom that has an overall charge of zero, it has to contain equal numbers of protons and electrons. So if it has five electrons, which are negative, it has to have five protons, which are positive, because that way the positive and negative cancel out. Now the next thing that we need to think about is something that Rutherford kind of ran into. He said, okay, this sounds great, this idea that we have positively charged protons within the nucleus of the atom, but there are some issues with this. One is that he knew about you know, uh, something like an atom of beryllium, right? And he said, I know that it has four protons that are within the nucleus because I know that it has four electrons. We can measure this and so forth. And yet, if we have four protons and they're all packed into this tiny, tiny, tiny little nucleus, right? The pea sitting on the pitcher's mound of Fenway Park. Um, shouldn't all of those positive charges repel each other? I mean, you can't pack those things that tightly, right? So that's one problem. The next problem he realized was that a brilliant atom has four protons, right? Then if a proton has a mass of one AMU, one atomic mass unit, then the overall mass of the atom should be about four atomic mass units. But in actuality, it actually weighs about nine AMUs. So where's all the extra mass coming from? Well, you might be tempted to say, oh, it's coming from the electrons. Well, it doesn't work that way, because remember that electrons have a minuscule mass, right? such a small mass that we can't even really consider it. So where is where's the extra 5 AMUs of mass coming from? So there must be something else. So Rutherford came up with this idea of another uh, particle in the nucleus, right? We'll call it a neutron. Okay, so a couple of important things to remember about neutrons. First off, neutrons are neutral, right? So they have no charge. Uh, all right. And then also, they have a mass of about 1 AMU. So um, they're a lot like a proton, except a proton's positive one, neutrons are neutral, no charge. And then both protons and neutrons have a mass of approximately one AMU, one atomic mass unit. So how does this solve our problem? Well, this solves the problem of the extra mass, right? Because if beryllium has a mass of about nine AMUs and four of those are protons, it makes sense that there must be five neutrons in there, giving it a total mass of about nine atomic mass units. Um, now, the other thing is, it does actually explain why in the world, um, or how in the world, we actually get all of these uh, things packed into the nucleus, right? Because the neutrons actually wedge themselves in between the protons, and they help to act as kind of a buffer zone in between the, the uh, protons to keep them from repelling each other. So, this actually um, kind of goes back to, to my kids, right? So, I have two wonderful little girls, and they're great, right? The problem is they get in the car in the back seat, and they sit there and they fight all the time, like, oh, she's looking at me, she's breathing my air, she's poking me with a sharp stick, right? And so they sit there and fight all the time, and it would get on, you know, my nerves, my wife's nerves, and so we thought, how in the world can we solve this problem? And so we suddenly had this idea that, wait, we should have another kid, right? Because um, by having another kid, you, what do you do? Well, you put them right between the two girls, right? So they're in the back seat, and the little guy's right in the middle, and suddenly they're trying to, like, stab each other with spears and stuff, and you say, oh, you're going to hit the baby, and bam, suddenly they stop fighting. 
It's a brilliant, right? And so I should have named him like Jimmy Neutron or something because he's just like a little neutron because he fits right in there and uh, keeps the, you know, the two protons from repelling each other too much. Unfortunately, um, my wife vetoed this, and so not allowed. All right. Um, the problem is then also uh, the little guy gets older, and then he starts fighting with his sisters on both sides, and so that's another uh, story. So what do we have going on inside of the atom itself? A couple of things you should remember. We have three subatomic particles, right? Protons, neutrons, and electrons. You should also remember the overall kind of relative charge on each. Protons are positive with a plus one charge. Neutrons are neutral, no charge. Electrons have a minus one charge. You should also remember the, um, you know, the relative mass of each one. Protons and neutrons each have a mass of approximately one AMU, one atomic mass unit. Electrons are much, much, much smaller than that and have a negligible mass, so small that we don't typically worry about it. So I have a question for you. If atoms are mostly empty space, we said they're 99.99999% empty space, why can't we just put our hands right through solid objects? Well, some of us can, right? Here's my oldest daughter. Um, <laughs> she's awesome. So there's a picture of her, you know, breaking through a solid object with her hand, right? But most of us, you know, when we actually try to hit a board or something, it gets stopped. So what's going on here? Well, it turns out that, uh, remember that the atom itself has this, uh, you know, little nucleus, right? But what's on the outside of it? Well, remember that this is actually the, uh, the electrons, right? So these electrons are kind of this big fuzzy area on the outside. And so what's happening? Well, if I bring my hand too close to another object, well, when I do this, I actually am bringing these um, atoms that are in my own hand close to the atoms that are in the object. And remember that when you get any two um, things close together that happen to have the same charge, what do they do? They repel each other, right? And so suddenly, I get this repulsive force between my hand and the object, and it pushes it apart. So when you're actually touching like a wall or a brick or your face, um, what's actually happening is you're not touching the object itself. As your hand comes close to it, you're actually getting this electrostatic repulsive force you know, between your hand and the object. So let's go ahead and do a little bit of practice. Okay. Um, so let's say that we have an atom. The atom has 20 protons, right? So true or false? Um, if, a, if the atom is neutral, it has to have 20 electrons. Well, that's true, right? Because um, if it has 20 positive protons, it has to have 20 negative electrons to neutralize it, right? To have an overall neutral charge. Okay, what about this? If it has 20 protons, and if it also has 20 neutrons, it'll have an overall mass of approximately 40 AMUs. Well, that's got to be true as well, right? Because the 20 protons, 1 AMU each, 20 neutrons, 1 AMU for each of those, and so overall a mass of approximately 40 atomic mass units. Okay, what about this last one? It has 20 protons. If it has 18 electrons, will it have an overall charge of negative 2? Hmm... Actually, no, it won't. So how do we figure this out? Well, if you want a formula, the formula is actually pretty simple. You can calculate the charge on something, on an atom, by looking at the number of protons minus the number of electrons. Okay. So in this case, we have 20 protons, 18 electrons, so overall, we're going to have a charge, but it's going to be a plus 2 charge. Okay, some people write plus 2, some write 2 plus, it doesn't matter. Okay, so it's going to have an overall plus 2 charge. If it, um, if it has a negative 2 charge, it means it has two extra electrons. Because remember, this is where a lot of people uh, get confused because it's kind of counterintuitive. Electrons are negative. So by having more electrons you're going to give something a negative charge by having fewer electrons you're going to end up giving it a positive charge okay so if we're talking about elements um, 
What do we need to know about it? Well, you need to know that each and every element has a unique number of protons in its nucleus. So for instance, carbon has six protons in its nucleus. And if you have an atom and it has less than that, it can't be carbon. If it has more than that, it can't be carbon. If you have a mystery atom and it has exactly six protons in the nucleus, it's carbon. It's kind of the, the barcode that tells you exactly what the element is. Okay. Now, the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom is actually called the atomic number. Okay. Very, very important um, number, the atomic number. It's given the abbreviation back up. It's given the abbreviation of uh, Z, which seems kind of weird, but um, in German, number is Zoll, and it turns out that, uh, you know, the Germans were super good chemists and still are, so um, we often give the atomic number abbreviated as Z. And if you look at the periodic table, you'll find that it's actually organized um, in order of atomic number. Also, the next thing you should know is that each element has a unique name and symbol. Some of these are really um, kind of clear, right? Oxygen is O, carbon is C. Um, some of them are a little bit weird, like sodium is Na, or uh, tungsten is W, or you know, gold is Au, and lead is Pb. Um, one thing to notice is that if it does have two letters, it's always uppercase, lowercase uppercase, lowercase. No writing in all caps. It's a really bad idea. Okay. It's like if you walk into a chemistry bar and um, you order capital C, lowercase o, you get cobalt, which is a nice metal, and it's kind of fun to play with. You order capital C, capital O, you get carbon monoxide, and you die. So make sure that you order the right one. Alright, so where do these names come from? Well, uh, it's just kind of interesting, but some of these actually come from the Latin name. So, um, lead it used to be known as plumbum in Latin, right? Which is where we actually get the term plumber from, is because plumbers used plumbum, they used lead pipes in, you know, doing plumbing. And so we keep the, the symbol to kind of commemorate that. Other uh, symbols actually come from the historic name. So tungsten used to be known as wolfram, which you have to ad admit is a much cooler name than tungsten. All right, so here's our periodic table. Um, you probably know and love this thing. I mean, who doesn't? You probably have a shower curtain or you keep it in your wallet like I do because everyone loves the periodic table. Uh, you know, whenever I get pulled over because I'm speeding or something, you know, and they say license and registration, I just pull out my periodic table and say, you know what, I don't think you need to see my license and registration. They're like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize you were a chemist, right? <laughs> um, okay, anyway, so here's our periodic table, but something that you should be aware of is that if you look at... Um, you know, the actual periodic table, you'll notice a few things. Um, one is that these are arranged in order of atomic number. So this little number up here, so hydrogen is number one, helium is number two, and then lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, and so forth. Another thing you'll notice is that when we get down here, we have 55, 56, and then it somehow skips to 71. It's because these guys are actually down here. So 57, 58, all the way up to 70, which we then pick up at 71, 72, 73, and so forth. So um, why don't we actually just stick these guys back in, you know, to where they belong? Well, it's because it would make the periodic table really, really long, and then it wouldn't fit on a nice little card that can fit in your wallet. So instead, we just drop what we call the lanthanides and actinides down here to the bottom. Not a big deal. Um, you should never try to memorize the periodic table. I don't think it's a useful activity. Um, you can for fun, I guess, if you enjoy that kind of thing. But um, I have limited brain space, right? And so I don't like to memorize things that I can easily just look up, like things on the periodic table. I mean, that's what it's for, is to allow me to, to look at it and to figure things out. But what I do want you to understand is I want you to be familiar with the periodic table. You know, when I talk about metals versus nonmetals, you should know where I'm talking about those. Right? If I um, ask you to get the atomic number of potassium, you should be able to look at that and relatively quickly figure out here's potassium has an atomic number of 19. Now, where in the world did we actually get this lovely periodic table? Well, it comes from this guy, Dmitry Mendeleev, who, as you can see, had a pretty swell beard. Now, Mendeleev, Russian chemist, 
and he was sitting around, and he used to play basically atomic solitaire. He would take the elements that they knew about, and he would write down all the information on it, and then he'd basically rearrange these things in different, in different ways, right? And he would just kind of stack them and, and lay them out. You know, there's not a lot to do <laughs> um, back then in Russia, so he'd just keep doing this over and over again, kind of rearrange them however he wanted to. And as he did this, he actually found that there was a, a repeating pattern of properties. That's kind of hard to say, repeating pattern of properties, which he called the periodic law. So basically, um, he, would, he would be going along and he would see, oh, you know what? Um, here's sodium, and it reacts violently when it comes in contact with water. And so he'd put that in a column. And then he'd keep going, keep going, and then suddenly like, oh, here's another element, potassium. It also reacts violently upon contact with water. I'm going to go ahead and put that in the same column as, you know, sodium. And so as he did this, he started to, you know, realize all of these repeating pro properties. Now, um, there were other chemists working on the, the same thing at the same time. In fact, you know, they came up with the periodic table independently. But one of the things that that made Mendeleev really famous and, you know, amazing was that he actually, um, as he was doing this, he realized that there were gaps in the, you know, in his periodic table. And so, you know, kind of holes where, you know, these, these things would belong. And so he started to think about this, right? And he was like, hmm, I wonder what, um, you know, causes this. And most of us would probably say, well, it's probably, you know, I made a mistake somewhere, I better redo it. Not Mendeleev, right? So Mendeleev's like, look, I am Mendeleev, and I have this amazing beard. I cannot be wrong, and so it must be that, um, that there are elements that just haven't been discovered yet, and that they, they are going to fit into these nice little holes in my periodic table. And so here's this mystery element, and he would actually go in, and he would predict that these elements would be discovered, but not only that, he would actually predict their properties. And the amazing thing is, he was right. Over and over again, as, you know, 50, 60, 70, 100 years go by, and suddenly people are filling in these gaps, and they're like, oh, Mendeleev was right again. Amazing guy. So now, thanks to Mendeleev and others, we have the modern periodic table that we all know and love. Now, Again, I don't want you to memorize the periodic table, but we're going to go over a couple of, you know, trends that I want you to, to understand, okay? So the first is that whenever things are in the same column, they are going to behave in the same way. So if you're bored, you can actually uh, try, try Googling alkali metals, right? These guys over here on the far left, and you'll find out that the alkali metals all behave the same way upon contact with water. They produce hydrogen gas, which is flammable, and they explode. Okay, lots of fun. Um, so elements that are in the same column behave the same way. They have the same uh, basic traits, chemical properties. Okay, the next thing I want you to, to know is where are the metals at? Okay, so metals are going to be these guys that I am highlighting in this lovely yellow color. So you'll all of these, all of these, all of these, and all of these guys down here, all metals. So you can see that about 75% of the periodic table are metals. There are tons of these things, okay? And then what else do we have? Well, we have the non-metals. So the non-metals are going to be these guys over here on the right-hand side, okay? So these are metal, or non-metals over here. We're going to talk about um, what makes a metal and a non-metal and some of their traits. Okay, so these are our non-metals. Um, now, actually I missed a little bit, let's see. Uh, aluminum's a metal. Okay, now the next thing that we need to worry about would be what about the uh, the semi-metals or the metalloids? Okay, so the metalloids See, I don't know if this is going to actually fit. But the metalloids are right along this stair step right here. Okay, so you can see the stair step. And so um, we actually have, we've got these two, four, six, and seven or so. So these are the non-metals right along this stair step there. 
they're going to have properties in between the two. And we're going to talk about each of these in a little more detail. So first off, um, when we're discussing metals, what do they look like, right? Well, we all know about metals, gold, copper, iron, silver. Uh, these things are, you know, they're solids. In fact, all of the metals are solids at room temperature, except for mercury, which is a liquid. Uh, they reflect light, they're shiny, they conduct heat and electricity very well, which is why we use copper wiring. Um, they're malleable, which means we can pound them into aluminum foil, right, these thin sheets of foil. They're ductile, which means that we can draw them into long wires like copper wires. And this is different than the non-metals. So non-metals can actually be solids, liquids, or gases at room temperature. So uh, something like carbon is a solid at room temperature, like you know graphite or diamond. Um, some of them, like bromine, are liquids at room temperature, and then others are actually gases at room temperature. So things like oxygen or chlorine, uh, nitrogen, are all gases. Now, um, they are very poor conductors of heat and electricity, uh, which is why we don't make uh, wires out of something like uh, carbon or... <laughs> You know, nitrogen, it just wouldn't work. They're, they're kind of the opposites of the metals, so they're poor conductors of heat and electricity. Um, the solids, if they are solids, are typically very brittle. You know, they, they can't be smashed into uh, thin sheets or drawn into wires. It doesn't work. And then the metalloids are in between. So these have some properties of metals and some properties of nonmetals. So, for example, silicon. Okay, silicon's a, a metalloid or a semi-metal and it's shiny and it conducts electricity, right? Both properties of metals and yet it doesn't conduct heat very well and it's brittle, which are the properties of nonmetals. So we're almost done, but there are just a few terms that I want you to know, a couple of kind of vocabulary words. Okay, the first one is that anytime we talk about a period, what I mean is a, a row, a horizontal row, okay? so. Um, you know, periods are horizontal rows, okay, uh, left to right. Groups, sometimes known as families, are the vertical columns, so these guys go up and down. These are very important because remember that um, elements that are in the same group have similar chemical properties. Now, the next thing would be um, the the main group elements, okay? So notice that some of these actually have the little letters up at the top. So um, anything that says like 1A, 2A, uh, 3 through 8A, those are your main group elements, okay? The ones that kind of stick out at the top. Now the rest of them are going to be known as the transition metals. So the transition metals are all of these guys and even these ones at the bottom, sometimes known as the inner transition metals. So we're going to kind of go right up the stair step, and then those would be the transition metals right there. Okay, now remember that metals behave a certain way, but there are actually some of the other metals as well that we should be aware of. Okay, one is, what, are, what about the alkali metals? This is the one that I said that you should uh, check out on YouTube just for fun, because they... They react violently with water. So the alkali metals are column 1A. So that's these guys right here. Notice that it does not include hydrogen. In fact, I should have mentioned earlier that hydrogen is a non-metal. In fact, some periodic tables actually put uh, hydrogen not um, in, in column 1A, but they actually move it way over here and put it next to helium. And there's some good and bad reasons for doing that. But what you should remember is that hydrogen is not a metal at all. In fact, it's actually a non-metal. Okay, the next group that we should be um, concerned with would be the alkaline earth metals, or the alkaline earth elements. Okay, either way. So the alkaline earth metals are right here, column 2A. All right, so alkaline metals, column 1A. Alkaline earth metals, column 2A. Transition metals would be all of those guys there in the middle. And then what about the, uh, the halogens? Okay, well the halogens, let's go ahead and highlight those in green. Halogens are way over here in column 7A. So these guys right here. All right, so column 7A, and then 
last but certainly not least, we have the, uh, the noble gases. Sometimes, um, well, these guys are the noble gases way over here, column 8A. Called the noble gases because they're noble. They, they don't like to mix with the unwashed masses. They don't like to react with things. So it's actually really, really, really hard to make a, you know, a, a chemical bond with any of these noble gases um, because they, they really just don't want to react with anything else. Now there are names for some of these other groups, the, some of these other columns like the chalcogens and so forth, but these are the ones I want you to remember. I want you to know where the metals and the nonmetals are. I want you to remember the transition metals. I want you to remember alkali and alkaline earth, and then halogens and noble gases. All right, and I think that pretty much sums it up for atoms and elements.